Welcome to Cata Lunch and Learn. Thank you all for joining us for a 30 minute lunch debate. We have two speakers today, Dan and Sarah. Um, I just wanna do a little housekeeping. We'll all be muted to avoid any background noise. I would encourage all of you to put your questions into the chat and we'll run through them later. Um, today, we're going to discuss rapid delivery, the 15 minute revolution. And is it really the future or a fat? Do customers really want it? I'm gonna kick off and ask the first question. Is this how I'm going to be shopping, grocery shopping in the future? Please let me know. Thanks for the introduction, Mayha, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily going to be how you're going to be forced to shop for your groceries in the future. Um, it's probably worth just outlining what exactly what we're talking about with rapid delivery or quick commerce, as it's also called. So there's all these names that we're probably all quite familiar with, the go Pass, mm -hmm. the Gettys, the Zaps, the Gorillas. These are what we call the pure plays. So they're generally offering delivery within 10, 15, 20 minutes. You've then got the aggregators. So the Deliveroo's, the Uber Eats, um, who are offering to bolt on some groceries with a meal delivery. And then you've got, you know, like uh, Tesco and um, Sainsbury's and yep. Ocado who will launch their own sub one hour um, delivery options. So, so that's sort of how the landscape looks. Um, you know, one of the questions we've been asking ourselves is, is it really the future or is it just a fad? I uh, don't think we can dismiss it as a fad. Um, there's a lot of money behind these. Mm -hmm. They're very well funded. Six yep. of them are unicorns. Um, GoPuff is talking about an IPO. So I, I think there's, there's too much money. There's too much investment here. And what kind of consolidation we'll start to see will be interesting. Um, just Eat here in the UK has recently started to offer groceries because it's accepted that Uber Eats and Deliveroo, its competitors are offering that and it's what customers want. So even if the margins look, you know, almost non-existent and the market is still quite small, they're recognizing that there's a there's an opportunity there and, and really that they might lose customers um, if yeah. they don't, if they don't yeah. sort of follow up and offer that. Um, and the other interesting thing we picked up on was that British land, this very sort of, you know, small C conservative property company um, has acquired a lot of space um, 189 million, I think it was, worth of space to um, fulfill this to fulfill this need for um, last minute, you know, last mile delivery and, and you know, just in time logistics. So you know, it's interesting to see that because their strategy has always been retail and offices. Yeah. Um, right. So so they, it, it's quite a leap for them to move into this sector. So I would say. You, you are going to have other options, Mayor, in terms of how to get your groceries. Um, but, you know, I, I'd say forced to be reckoned with. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think what's what we're seeing from um, Tesco and Sainsbury's with their sub one hour deliveries is probably a bit of a defensive move from them because they can see mm -hmm. these new pure play um, operators encroaching on their territory and they don't want to lose market mm -hmm. share, um, even, even though at the moment it's only a tiny proportion yeah. of, of the market. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got to remember, we've got to keep this in context that at the moment this is being trialled in really urban locations mm -hmm. across the UK and across the world. It's, it's in capital cities, it's in secondary and tertiary cities. Um, and, and at the moment, the pure plays are all about kind of capturing, capturing users, growing that user base and demonstrating that the market is there. It's a similar um, operation, if you like, to how Uber established mm -hmm. themselves, um, which is just to try and own the market. Yeah. Um, what's new here, I think, is that what the what the market is 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 almost a, you know in some ways is a new market. Uber were convenient taxi ride replacement to mini cab, black cabs, yellow cabs, whatever you had. Whereas this is actually saying rather than replacing grocery with grocery, it's actually trying to capture a slice of that grocery market by delivering super fast products. Now to start off with, I think we were we were all quite cynical about it. It kind of why does does anyone why does anyone need anything in less than fifteen minutes? But I think this is what makes it most interesting for me is that actually there's a fairly major disruption going on here, which is that this is not about, um, you know, this is not about just trying to incrementally improve something which customers would ask for, but it's actually about trying to deliver new demand to a market by offering a service that once people use it will realize how convenient it is. Yeah. So in that way, it's actually a pretty innovative move. No, I, I, I agree with you, Dan. Um, and it always reminds us of um, Henry Ford, doesn't yeah. it? When he said, you know, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. They wouldn't have been able to envisage um, the Model T, which was, you know, a car that was excessively priced and was available and, and got them there faster. That all they 
they could see was they wanted to get the yeah. faster. So it's that idea that, you know, do customers want it? Well, if we create a service, people aren't going to say, I now want, having tried something, mm -hmm. they might say it's too expensive. They might say they can't afford it. They might say it doesn't offer perhaps the same range, but then certainly not going to say, we'd like to go back to it being less convenient, less available and slower. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I mean, what we don't know yet is that whether one of these companies um, that we're seeing who's, who's making, making this market is going to be a Tesla mm -hmm. or an Uber or, or whether they're going to be WeWork, you yeah. know, whether they're really, they're making a market, but the, we don't, nobody knows yet what the commercials look like at the end game. Um, and you just touched on something which I think is really important at the moment, or certainly for this year, Sarah, which is that we're in, a, we're in an inflationary cycle where every consumer has got pressure on their pocket and pressure on their disposable income. So what seems like a, a super uber convenient, almost in some cases kind of lazy or last minute mm -hmm. method of shopping or choice of yeah. choosing how to shop at certain points or at certain need states is going to be under pressure because cost is coming under pressure. The major supermarkets are very carefully already laying out what they're going to do. We've seen Asda this week um, listing over, I think, around 250 price products yeah. that they are holding the price on and have confirmed they'll hold that price through this year, having reduced prices. So they're, they're all basics, things like apples, mm -hmm. um, fruit juices, you know, things, things that people use every, every day, every week. And that means, you know, that, that primarily, I believe, is, is Asda and, and the others um, putting out a defensive action against the discounters, yeah. against Audi and Lidl, to make sure that they, they're protecting their position and their market share from them as costs and, and, the, and, and people's incomes come under pressure. But it also, as a, as a side effect almost, makes this landscape for, for Getir, for the others, for the others, you know, the other unicorns, it makes them harder. It makes it harder because the price difference will be more stark. So the price you're paying for this convenience and this super quick delivery will be bigger by the end of this year, I can guarantee, than it is right now. It will be. However, and again, this is something I think that we've always assumed and, and part of the model is you accept that the price is higher and how do you and the way that you fund all the extra work that mm -hmm. these um, rapid delivery operators are doing is, you know, the work of picking, the work of delivering, but the customer usually does. The way of funding that is with a delivery fee and with higher um, per unit prices yep. compared. And, and that's an accepted, you know, accepted wisdom. The interesting thing, though, is we've seen that GoPuff has started price matching with two Tesco stores only on 100 products, and it's not offering the same value you'd get if you had a club card, and it's not promotions. But they are starting to look at the value side of what they do and mm -hmm. recognizing that customers, exactly as you say, assume they're going to be paying more, um, and they're really trying to attack that perception. And it was interesting, I think it was two days ago, or possibly yesterday, um, Jiffy, another of the um, operators, what are they doing? They're price matching with Tesco.com. Mm -hmm. The story was in the grocer a couple of days ago. So yep. not only they're, they're taking it one step further, GoPuff has laid down this gauntlet of saying, actually, we can provide value. And Jiffy's saying, forget about, you know, two stores in Shoreditch and Camden. Mm -hmm. We're talking about price matching with Tesco.com. So it's very interesting to see how that's going to evolve. Um, and someone like our friend Uncrowd, Richard yeah. Hammond, you know, his comment on this on LinkedIn was, so, oh, look, we're, you know, we're spending even more money as a rapid delivery operator. We're going to spend even more money acquiring customers because, because as a business, we're losing money because all these businesses are in this sort of growth phase where they're not actually making a profit, but no. they're building the market and they're acquiring yeah. customers. And that's the, and it's, I suppose it's how long can that, you know, can operators make it pay? Well, uh, yeah, and it, it, I don't think any of us know the answer no. quite yet. I mean, obviously there's an end state, but if we look at Uber, you know, the Uber have grown hugely. Um, I can't remember if they are now at, if they're now turning a profit yet or not, or getting close to it, or you know narrowing their losses. Mm -hmm. But also they are now you know they're now Uber are now raising their prices. The the you know the comparative price of an Uber versus a Black Cab in London yeah. is is pretty close now. So they've they've spent the last decade mm -hmm. buying the market, controlling the mini cab market, if you yeah. like. Um, and now they're, and part of that process was 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 relatively low prices, super convenient, yeah. quick to get a cab to wherever you are. All of those things, which have similarities with what we're talking about here, mm -hmm. um, but now the price has gone up. It's become much more of a discretionary choice. 
And so it's going to be hard, you know, it would be hard for Uber to ret retain the, the, the momentum of the a number of trips that they're delivering mm -hmm. with the price rises. Um, and, and also we can see, you know, see how risky it is, even with something like Netflix mm -hmm. having a 25% um, reduction in its share value because its acquisition yeah. has, has stalled yeah. in the previous quarter. So these, these, you know, these things that seem massive and huge yeah. are still actually pretty vulnerable. Um, and I suppose an interesting point that you, you make, uh, you know, that price matching is brave, but it will come at a cost. Yeah. But the other bit that we don't know is, you know, this is, this is really about convenience retail and really about urban locations. This is, we don't believe that this can work nationally on, in any country. We believe it only works where there's a high density of people and there's therefore a real opportunity to create efficient distribution centers, small distribution centers with a small amount of SKUs yeah. that are close to lots of people. As soon as you start dis dissipating around ge geographically and people are spread out, you can't hit the 15 minute or sub 15 minute delivery time yeah. and you haven't got enough custom ba customer base to actually build a turnover. So it's only ever, it's never going to be the, the dominant way of shopping, but it could become an important part of the landscape. Yeah, not in the UK anyway. Um, it's interesting what you say about the sub 15, 20 minute, because as you said earlier on, the supermarkets are coming up with their own um, responses to this, which are all within the hour. Yeah. And perhaps the idea there is to try and explore whether that's a sweet spot mm -hmm. where customers still get the value they would expect from their ordinary big four retailer yeah but i'm still in you know an excellent time frame i mean how many years ago did amazon prime and next day delivery was introduced and i think a lot of people said well why on earth do you need next day delivery yeah and now we're all so accustomed to it that you know you buy the birthday present to your children two days before and then get into a dreadful panic because we've all got so used to not having yeah. plans yeah um, and I think that's what that's what I guess this convenience because it's not it's, it's also they're not no one's trying to replicate a full mm -hmm. shop they're trying you know they've got somewhere between probably a thousand and two thousand yeah. SKUs in each location but what they are trying to do is is meet that convenience point if you can not have to worry about running out of bread or milk or coffee yeah. or whatever it is your kind of store cupboard staples because somebody will bring them to you within 15 minutes if you realize yeah it means you don't have to think ahead in the same yeah. way or you don't have to hold stock of stuff. It's like a just-in-time approach to society. You know, yeah. if our, stock, our store cupboards and our fridges yeah. are now, you know, we're replenished. We're outsourcing it. Yeah, yeah, we're outsourcing storage yeah. to someone else and we're paying for that convenience. The, the other thing I wanted to mention, I think, you know, along those lines is, is that, um, you know, we, we, we assume that there, or, or we're talking from a point of view of, the dominant brands of Tesco, Sainsbury's, Azure, and Morrison, and of course, you know, Aldi and Lidl is, is the the core the core providers of grocery in the UK. Um, but if you're 20 or 19 and you have no brand loyalty and don't really go to the shops very no, much, except when you've been um, sent by your parents, except when you've been sent by your parents, or you've, you've just gone away to university and you're existing on crisps yeah. and pasta, yeah. <laughs> then actually you know you don't think oh, i love tesco's i love sainsbury's no. or their prices are good or not even i love them but you know i know what do they represent yeah tesco represents great range great value for example yeah. waitrose better quality higher price yeah sainsbury's somewhere in the middle after yeah. morrison's cheap you, you don't have those references to hand no that, that no help you to instantly make a decision about where you should no so you could become completely loyal to get you it because yeah. your shopping needs are relatively straightforward yeah. And you you don't, or, or even if you don't become loyal to loyal to one of the brands, you could become platform agnostic. Platform, yeah. But but it's all about it's about this this ability. So in fact, you could see a young the younger generation of customers, um, from affordability notwithstanding, cost notwithstanding, of course. But you could see a section of our younger population using these services to become the default way of, of basic shopping or Especially need me. Especially via the mobile phone, which is it's that generation that's grown up with a mobile phone as an extension of their hand and used to used to administering their whole life. I think, and I think that's an important, um, that's a really important point that because it's about being in people's pockets. Yeah. And I think that's another reason why we're seeing Chop Chop from Sainsbury's and Tesco doing similar with a sub hour, yeah. not just sub, sub hour. The sub hour is still very fast. If no one had launched sub 15 minutes, that would have seemed yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, they, they're, they're obviously picking from a wider range. So you have more choice yeah. from there. I did a test order with Sainsbury's three or four weeks ago. And, you know, when it, I think I ordered about 30 items, yeah. but deliberately some of those were not basic apples, um, oranges, yeah. bread, milk. Um, and, 
the, the, the point I wanted to make actually is that they're getting in people's pockets. You can only access those services through a specific app, which is on your phone. So I think as well as defending the territory against these, these newer brands, what they're also doing is making sure that they are in the right place for the younger generation, which is on your phone, in your pocket or in your hand. And I think that's a really important thing for those legacy brands to, 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 to think about and to maintain. Yeah, how they can have the relationship is created simply by Sinter being available via the phone, which is where a young person, a person yeah, of this yeah. who's grown up in this way, expects to be able to access things. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I guess, and you know, really, we're talking about it as, as an innovation, and, we, and I think it is. I was, um, we, we, at the last session, we were talking about um, Just Walk Out technology. We'd opened um, the Audi shop and go in Greenwich. And so we're talking about that and the market in general. Um, and that, you know, what's, what, what that does is it takes the big pain point away from shopping, which is queuing at the checkout, unpacking a trolley, repacking in the bags, and then bringing it all home. Well, what this, these, these delivery services do is they take all of that pain away. So if going to the shop is a pain rather than just the checkout, then actually what these guys are doing is yeah. taking all the, all the pain away and they're doing it for you. And, that's, and at the moment, they're offering to do it for crazily brilliant promotions. You know, yeah. five pounds off here, ten yeah. pounds off here, twenty yeah. pounds worth of groceries for ten pounds. Well. Exactly. That, that customer acquisition is what they're spending all their money on. So I mean, it, it is. You know that they're going to become conscious of price over the next year because they're, get, they're going to have to, and but they can afford to. Yeah. They can afford to give things away at the moment, almost in terms of their exactly you know pricing strategy. Some of them will give you. It's fifty percent off your first five orders, not even just the first yeah, one. Yeah. So it's about it's about re, they're they're all about the rhythm and the retention and the reuse. So yeah, it I becomes mean, habit forming. If you're a sort of if you're if you have the time and the energy, so and it probably doesn't even take that long. But if you if you've got the right mindset and you want to try out and you live in the right area, if yeah. you're going two or going three, then try them out. Use them mm -hmm. all. You can probably eat for you know a couple of months for very yeah. well for yeah, scarcely yeah. anything. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. Amazing, guys. Thank you. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to start with one. Uh, will this change the entire landscape of grocery retail? Um, I think probably not the entire landscape. Sam mentioned earlier the point about density of population. So if you haven't got that density, then you're, you're simply not going to have access. To, you know, you and I, Meher, we live in Zone 5, and we don't have access to any of the pure plays yet because the... <laughs> The houses are too spread out. There just aren't enough of us who are um, going to be in that position to, to make it worthwhile putting a dark store there in order to get the products to us within 50 minutes. So I think it's worth actually one of some of the research we did when we were looking into this topic. We looked at Latin America, which you know sounds a world away, but it's a few years ahead of us in terms mm -hmm. of um, where they're at with their rapid delivery. Um, and it's quite an interesting direction of travel, albeit the demographics are very different. A lot of this is all about people living in very densely populated cities. Um, and it's where public transport is difficult, for example. So actually getting about to do your groceries, mm -hmm. if someone can do that for you, that's really helping you out hugely. Um, what's happening over there is you've got the aggregators. So the deliveroos have now become the end to end grocers. So they've set up their own dark stores. They're picking from their own stores instead of third parties because they're recognizing the scale of the market makes it worthwhile. Um, the pure plays, really interestingly, are creating what they're calling super apps. So they're expanding into other verticals like pharmacy, for example. Mm -hmm. They're trying to work out how can we be more useful um, and be more used by our customers going way beyond grocery and using the fact that they've got all this digital data and they've got this very ready access to their customer base. They're almost... Um, sort of digital first companies and data led entities rather than um, you know grocers per se. Um, the smaller stores are becoming digital. So they are um, getting rid of queuing and they're eliminating friction. So they're sort of accepting we are a convenience store. First and foremost, we need to encourage people to come. We need to be quick, get in and out fast. And the larger stores are recognizing they don't need as much space for grocery shopping. So they're hiding space off for things like um, food service. Mm -hmm. So like the restaurant hub that we designed um, for Sainsbury's and Bopar and that's, that's yeah. now open in Sellio in Birmingham um, and co-working. And they are also letting space to third party um, operators, like things that complement, you know, the sort of big box family offer. So, you know, I, I suppose in terms of changing the entire landscape, I'd say probably not, you know, in a very, in an entirely fundamental way. I think mm. it's, 
the, the most positive outcome will be that we as shoppers have a lot more choice. Um, I think, yeah, I think so. I think, I mean, it's in, will still be that. I think what you, what you say about Latin America is interesting about these, uh, you know, creating super apps, which is a bit, a bit like in some ways what how WeChat in, in China morphed from being a kind of WhatsApp equivalent mm -hmm. into one of the primary or if not the primary place yeah. to communicate, to do business, to, to sell yeah, and to buy mm -hmm. and do everything. So there's, a, there's an interesting kind of digital model there that, that, that just because of you start in one sector mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that that's where you'll end up. So th these, these brands, one of these brands could end up transforming something completely away from grocery, we just mm -hmm. don't know yet. I think, I think what they will do is they will transform in the short term the competitiveness for local shopping, for convenience shopping, for those shopping missions, you know, after work, on the way home, or on the way to work in the morning. If, if you can get stuff delivered, then maybe those get cut out. We also have seen that Tesco in their, they, they announced their results a couple of weeks ago, and for this year, they're also focusing again on more urban stores. So in part, that's about, you know, whether that's a reaction to what's happening here or not, or whether it's just knowing that they need to get closer to their customers yeah. and they need to get closer in terms of offering convenience and shorter des shorter trips. It's it's all part of, you know, what's happening in, in this ecosystem around urban shopping. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't think it will, I don't think it's going to change the whole landscape, but I think it will have a major impact. It's worth, it's worth rem remarking, despite the valuations of some of these companies and the amount of money that's coming into this segment, this is currently a tiny segment of the market and there's inevitably going to be consolidation. Yeah. There will be one or two operators left in each territory in a, you know, in a couple of years. And, and some of those who get bought out will have done very well from that, you know, from in terms of recouping their investment, whether it ever turns a profit or not. But you know, just to bear this in mind in terms of how small a segment it is, and I haven't got a percentage for you, but Ocado, which has been operating in the UK as a delivery only specialist, large, you know, large full shop delivery and is regarded as the global innovator in a lot of the technology, has been operating in the UK for 20 years and has a market share of UK grocery market of 1.8%. So that is how small Ocado is in comparison to Tesco, which is close to 30%, um, and, and Aldi, which is around 8 or 9%, and um, Co-op and Waitrose are around 5 Just shows you how small that bit of that delivery brand's market is. And, you know, all of this market combined is much, much smaller than that right now. It's amazing. That's insane. The card is tiny then. Yeah. Um, but they're so big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they are big, good. but actually, yeah. you know, com in comparison with the market and with Tesco, they're still very yeah. small. Okay. So one final thing um, is, so you touched on brand loyalty earlier. Do we reckon that's gone completely? Brand loyalty has completely gone out the window, or do you reckon it will be another few years before that happens? Because there are still a certain, there's a certain demographic that will say, you know what, I'm loyal to X, Y, and Z. I think I think loyalty in the grocery sector is overstated. Yeah. I think that it's really the loyalty comes from convenience in the sense that I've got one of the big four is close enough to me to mm. do my weekly shop, or I walk past a Tesco Metro or something on my way to or home from work and home. So I, that's where I shop. Or I particularly mm. value the price promise made yeah. by discounted or the quality offered by Waitrose yes. or yeah. something. That's, that's very important. I think that's a, that's a really sure, important yeah, point, actually. Sure I, I, think, loyalty, I think the discounters probably are, are the ones that get more loyalty because often you have to choose to switch part of your shop or all of your shop to yeah. Aldi, um, but then you realize, you know, great value and good quality. And so they generate loyalty. So I think, I think um, the, the brands understand their customers very well. And so yeah. they engender loyalty once that once you've got your, they've got your habits, but it's a bit like banking, you know, people don't switch banks very often, people don't switch supermarkets very often. Um, mm. so I, but I don't know that loyalty is, is dead. Um, but I think, I think, it's I'm morphing. Really it wasn't really a, a huge feature of grocery shopping. Perhaps it's a bit of a misnomer. Yeah, maybe. But I mean, but but absolutely, you would, you know, it, it might find that the successful, you know, one of the dominant operators in this market really does engender loyalty by finding that key, by finding that thing that can turn them into Tesla of this market, you know, really right. innovate yeah. into, into being the Apple or whatever, you know, and, and, and maybe doing much more than just grocery mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. That'd be great. 
All right. Uh, thank you both. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, actually, just before we finish, there was a question please. from Leander that actually I've just seen, which yeah. uh, it leads oh, on to what I was just saying. Sorry, um, she sent it to you. I apologise. I didn't say it's, it. It's in the chat. It's OK. Yeah. So it's just saying, can we, can, Leander's asking, can we see this being extended to other areas of retail other than groceries, such as fashion and homewares? And I think potentially, potentially there's, there's, you know, we could see, we could see it being, being used for, for all kinds of different products. What it is got, got it going to come down to is um, the, the choice that you need to offer for that to work. Um, we talked about when we talk about just walk out technology uh, a month ago, and we, we said that, you know, somewhere like Primark in principle looks like a, pr a brilliant candidate for, for cashierless stores because people typically have large baskets uh, low value and the queuing is a big queuing in prime queuing in the in the uh, at the at the, boss, the the cheaper fun faster end of fashion is is a, is a is a problem in the same way as it is in grocery the problem that we see with the technology is the the ability for it to be able to differentiate between a, a small and a medium t-shirt that's exactly the same color with exactly the same print on how can you manage your inventory accurately because i don't think that the technology is there yet and i think that what that's about is then there's an inventory issue. And I think that that's where um, at the moment grocery is good because you can carry a thousand SKUs and you can meet probably 80% of the needs of most shop yeah. emissions um, most of the time. Um, and I think that to do that with fashion, you'd need to carry a lot more or SKUs homewares. So, or yeah. homewares or, or, any, or, any, or any other sector. Mm. You probably need more SKUs and so therefore your dark stores are bigger and your turnover is lower because it's not a daily, daily retail yeah. purchase. Yeah. But if you think how put, putting that to one side, if you look at how Amazon expanded, if you're doing your daily core work with groceries and you're getting your turnover and your customers, then it becomes really easy to say, and why don't you buy a t-shirt? Yeah. You don't need, you know, you can start off with quite a defined small range of apparel to start off with and then build. So I think once there's a solid base and solid turnover and customer base, then potentially, yes, we could yeah. see all kinds of extensions. So Amazing. I think it's a, it's a really interesting part of the sector to watch, um, is, is my conclusion. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you, Leander, for that one lovely question. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, any inquiries? Any You want to chat to Dan and Sarah a little bit more about this? Inquiries at cada.co.uk. Um, I'll be sending out our invite for next month which is going to be on inflation. That is going to be one interesting topic. I hope to see all of you there. Um, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, yeah, thank you everybody for joining. For today and um, yeah. anyone who might be watching on YouTube afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, Bye guys. guys.